Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you are smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Now let me tell you, every like and subscription helps build the channel. You know what's even better? Spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. I had to like kind of change up the delivery of that a little bit. All right, so today's show will be the third of my six part series on Australian wines, four of which were donated to me by one of my Instagram followers, Jason Carley, shortly after I took my advanced exam last year. I had posted on social media about not passing the exam and that I would be resuming my studies shortly afterwards. So thank you again, Jason, for your generous donation. I really appreciate it. Toll Puddle, what does that name mean to you? For me, nothing until I started researching it for the show. Toll Puddle is a village in the southwest county of Dorset, England, kind of near Wales, it's the scene of one of the earliest labor protests concerning unions. Six men who became known as the Tolpuddle Martyrs were convicted of swearing secret oaths after forming an agricultural union and sentenced to Australia. Yeah, secret oath, man. One of those six, George Lovelace, landed in Tasmania. He worked on a property near the town of Richmond. That piece of land is part of the Tolpuddle Vineyard. The vineyard is a mixture of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Tollpuddle Vineyard was established in 1988, and it took its name from the Tollpuddle Martyrs. In 2011, Martin Shaw and Michael Hill Smith, who's a master of wine, purchased the land as a partnership. The wine is in the Coal River Valley of Tasmania, about 20 to 30 minutes from the town of Hobart, which is in the southeast part of Tasmania. The climate here is at the cool extremes for viticulture in Australia. Tasmania is especially suited to cool climate wines. I know them best for amazing champagne method sparkling wines, but you know what makes a lot of champagne? Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And both of those grapes, among others, do well in a cool climate environment. Being an island, Tasmania has a temperate climate that is marked by the strong winds of the Indian Ocean, Bass Strait, and Tasman Sea. These winds necessitate the use of large screens around the perimeter of vineyards in order to protect the vines. The cool climate of the regions gives way to a late harvest, typically around April. The effects of global warming have caused the area's grapes to progressively ripen slightly earlier, which has allowed most of the recent vintages to become successful. Now, this seems like a good time to mention that I've resurrected my merchandise line. I retired my 1337 wine line, but now I have my WWTV and hashtag outstanding line of merchandise. The outstanding line is all about positivity and is based upon my response of outstanding when I'm asked how I'm doing. I have polos, t-shirts, and accessories on Zazzle. Those are really for the WWTV side. Check out this sweet logo t-shirt I'm showing it. The outstanding line is all t-shirts. So far, I only have a small number of variations of t-shirts for both lines with more to come. Link below in the description, so please check them out and maybe buy a couple. All right, so let's get into the stats of this wine. The 2016 Toll Puddle Vineyard Pinot Noir, about 85 bucks US. 100% Pinot Noir, Coal River Valley region. Hand harvested, whole bunch and whole berry fermentation. Now whole bunch is the same as whole cluster. That means stems and all are part of the fermentation. Whole berry tends to mean the stems were gently removed to avoid the least amount of damage possible. Fermented in open top fermenters and it's a 13% ABV. Okay, let's get into the wine. Screw cap, again. Screw cap does not mean cheap, poorly made wine. Screw cap means you don't want to have a corked wine. No, screw cap is one of the best ways to preserve a wine. Now, they do make screw caps, and I've mentioned this many times before, they do make screw caps that kind of mimic the oxygen transfer rate, or OTR, of cork. So, for a sec, oh, this might be one of the larger ones. So, let's go grab my larger Coravin. Check it out. So, the difference between these two is visible. The white cap is your usual standard uh, size, and the black one is 
for the larger one. I, this is the first time, I'm actually excited, this is the first time I've actually used the larger Corvin uh, capsule. So that is awesome. Alrighty. Anyway, screw caps, I love them. They help preserve the wine. Yes, you can have screw caps that can mimic cork, but in general, you have a wine that will tend to not oxidize as fast. You can almost have a perfect seal, which is maybe not the best thing because then you get what's called reduct reduction and you sometimes get this sulfurous type of quality, but it blows off. It's not a big deal. So yeah, that's actually cool. All right, let's get into the wine. All right, so it's Pinot Noir. I mean, we know it's Pinot Noir, but the color, um, which my uh, battery crapped out on the uh, DJI Oslo Pocket, so you're not going to be able to actually see the color from above, but uh, it's definitely this kind of, it's definitely a pale, like, really a pale ruby, <clears throat> but it also shows a little bit of, shows a little bit of like browning on the edges. What is this again? 16. All right. So 16, so we're talking four, actually we're talking five years, because remember South, the Southern Hemisphere is six months ahead of us. So a 16, it truly, and you're, if you're tasting a wine, the beginning of the year, then it's truly that many years. So 16, yeah, it's five years. So it's got a decent amount of age to it. Now I wouldn't sit there and be like, oh, this is an old wine necessarily. But when we get into five years, we're starting to, we're getting to that kind of borderline that we're starting to get into wine with a decent amount of age. So you'll definitely see some change in the color. And of course, no staining on the glass because it is Pinot Noir. Right, let's just get into it. Man, you know, a couple episodes ago, I talked about how Chardonnay is not my favorite grape. It's not my favorite wine. That's the same thing with Pinot Noir. If I've not been, uh, I've not hid that fact. And when I went to Burgundy, I, I mentioned it. Pinot Noir is not my favorite wine, but I went to Burgundy because it's Burgundy. And you kind of have to make that pil pilgrimage to, you know, basically a sacred winemaking area. Like I went to Bordeaux first. Now I, I went to Burgundy. This Pinot Noir smells really good. I appreciate Pinot Noir. I like Pinot Noir. It's not my favorite, but I like good Pinot Noir. And this already smells good. I haven't even gotten that far into it. So you get that, you get that dry, more of a dry cherry. Not necessarily a sour cherry, you get like a dry cherry. But you also get like this, a touch of smoke out of this. You get a little bit of that, that little bit of funk, um, a little bit of just a touch of like manure. Um, a little barnyard in a good way, right? Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily equate this to Britannomyces, but you just get an earthiness, right? Um, kind of a desiccated and, and dried out mushroom and dead flowers. A little potpourri, but it's been kind of sitting out for a little long. Earthy. A little bit of touch, a touch of cinnamon to this. But yeah, like, so since the purpose of these wines is to help me with studying, and these are all testable wines, uh, for tasting, not just learning about Australia, but really just tasting wine. Where would I put this if I didn't know what it was? I would be, a, I would be a little confused. It would be one of those wines. I'm like, man, no, actually, I'm sorry. Australian Pinot or Tasmanian Pinot isn't quite testable. It, it could be on the test, but they probably wouldn't give it to me, but it could be in the master level, the master sommelier test, right? New Zealand Pinot Noir is absolutely testable. But with that said, let's assume that this is testable because it will be at some point, I guarantee you. It might be when I take the exam next time. And then they, they, they could throw this in there, I'm telling you, they could throw it in there and they just wanna see how close I get. Yeah, there's also like a bit of mint, a little bit of green, like I don't want a mint quality to it. So, and a bit of bramble, a little bit of rusticity to it. So, why is it not anything else? Well, with the Burgundy, while there's earthiness to it, I don't think there's, there's not enough earthiness to it. And the fruit, to me, should be more just sour and tart on the nose rather than like this kind of really dried out fruit, okay? With Oregon, it doesn't have enough fruit of ripe nature. 
New Zealand is closer to this from my experience. It's kind of like in between Oregon and Burgundy, right? It's like California, because California is like a fruit bomb most of the time. Even the cool climate ones are a little more fruitier. Now let's get on the palate here. So on the palate, it really tastes like Oregon, but like exceptional Oregon, all right? But what would take me away from Oregon? There's still enough rusticity to it. Like it would make me kind of go, I think this is New World, but it really tastes like Burgundy. So I probably would be like, well, oh, Mark, if you're really listening to what you're saying in the descriptions, when you're, when you're in front of the Master Sommeliers verbalizing all this, that should take you to New Zealand, okay? Or cool climate Southern Hemisphere. How about that? Tasmania, right? But I probably would just like get confused and I'd probably freak out a little bit and I'd be like, well, am I misidentifying Burgundy? Am I misidentifying Old World or am I misidentifying New World? And I think there's enough fruit on the palate to take you out of the Old World. There's a brightness to the fruit. There's a little bit, the cherry's a little bit brighter. It's not tart though. It's not sour. It's like just ripe. But it's not like, a, it's not ripe enough to really take me into California for sure. There's a touch of coffee to this. Not quite mocha, but like it's just a cup, touch, a touch of coffee bean. Not my favorite flavor, but I know that it'll happen in wine quite a bit. So I just kind of accept it. As long as it's not over the top on the coffee, I'm totally cool with this. And this tastes really good. Did I mention it tastes good? It tastes like freaking fantastic. Um, so it's got that. It's got that earthiness. But the earth is, is earth's a little bit richer now on, on the palate. The mushroom is there. It's not, the, the palate finishes riper and fresher than the nose. So that alone should be like not old world because old world should be the opposite or should stay the same. So it should be smells. It, it should like start ripe or start fresh and finish up dry, that type of thing, or it should stay dry throughout. It should, it should be taste tart and, and sour and dry. It should maintain that or it will start on the nose on that riper side, but not overly ripe and then it'll finish out in that tartness. This kind of goes the opposite. It kind of started off a little bit earthier and drier, and then it was like, oh no, man, we got some fruit here. We're, we're New World. Might be cool climate New World, but we're New World. This is really good wine. Forget the price. Like, it could be a 20 buck bottle of wine, it could be a $200 bottle of wine. And I'm not saying that they're the same. Trust me, I'm not trying to say that it's not priced appropriately, it's priced appropriately. There's excellent winemaking going on here. So it's not really a $20 bottle of wine. There's excellent winemaking going on here. It's all integrated, it's well balanced. Nothing, nothing dominates the wine. The acidity is there. Like whatever oak aging they're doing is not over the top new oak. Um, it's, yeah. Now age has probably played a little bit into this. The five years may have made it more old world in style because that's what happens to all wines. Well, especially new world wines, they taste like the old world, but usually it happens at least 10 years in 10, 15, 20 years. New world wines really are like very hard to distinguish between that and old world. There's another thing, and it's, it's the roasted coffee, but, and, and this is going to sound bad, but I equate that sometimes with, for lack of a better word, bug spray. I'm like the only person in the world that tasted that way. Uh, though um, my boss at work, I mentioned a different wine. I was like, you get a little bug spray? She goes, oh yeah. But I think it's power of suggestion. There's a, there's a, and this, again, this is an amazing wine and I really like it. But there's a chemical quality to it that I wouldn't put in a bad sense. I wouldn't say it's a negative to the wine. It's really, it's, it's really the coffee flavor. I this is the fur for all, whatever that, that chemical from roasting coffee happens. And I equate that to something else. Kind of like I mentioned, like my, my, uh, master sommelier, who's my mentor, doesn't really smell petrol, but smells shower curtain instead. Right. This is probably the actual like gasoline or that type of thing, but it smells shower curtain. And I mentioned that in the Pusey Vale reasoning that it really is shower curtain in this case. So when I smell that, and I taste that, especially when it's so slight, it's really that roasted coffee flavor, which is a component of aging. So yeah, and I find that it's more likely to happen outside of Burgundy. 
to, to get to, or outside of Europe, really, that I, to, for me to get that. I don't really ever get that in Burgundy. So that would also take me out of Burgundy, but would most likely put me in California because that's where I get it the most, is California. Like, cool climate, Anderson Valley, that type of thing. But with that said, this wine is spectacular. Listen, if you are a winemaker, especially if you're this winemaker, and you can maybe break it down for me, you know, hit, hit my webpage, do a contact. Um, any winemaker can really explain where this, and it's not just Pinot Noir. I actually get it from a lot of, I get it from Syrah a lot, from California. And you can kind of explain why I call it bug spray. It's not really bug spray, but it, there's a chemical quality, and this doesn't turn me off, but sometimes it turns me off. Because maybe it's because I just have it. I don't like coffee at all. That's probably what it is. That'd be, that'd be outstanding. I love the smell of coffee. Let's put it that way. I just don't like tasting it. All right, enough of that, man. This wine is really good. If you if you can afford the, the, the money for it, then you absolutely should buy it. If nothing else is Tasmanian Pinot Noir. When's the last time you had a Taz Pinot Noir? Probably never. I think this may be the first time, maybe the second time. So I don't get exposed to it. Though I've had plenty of Tasmanian sparkling pretty much one producer, but I've had plenty of that. And it's always delicious. Get this wine if you can afford it and uh, definitely seek it out. Okay. That's really going to do it for this episode. So um, yeah, again, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the show and then tell all your friends about it. And until next time, drink some badass Tasmanian Pinot Noir.